If you are vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Your next game is going to explore new frontiers, and here's why. In this episode, we find answers to what can we do to broaden our understanding of running games? And can Travis avoid the slippery slope to the old grognard? And who can help us break out of our D&D prison? Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast. I'm Travis. And I'm his brother Jordan. So... Uh, I've got a I've got a problem. Yeah, <laughs> clearly, as we've already established within the intro. Yeah, um, and that is, I guess, I'm old. Your brain is frozen in time <laughs> from when you first learned fifth edition D and D. You know, like the the ridges on your brain, and that like more ridges makes you more smart. Yeah, it's just smooth. Yours is an egg. Yeah, it's just an egg <laughs> rattling nice. around. Let's in crack a... that sucker open. <laughs> Sounds violent. <laughs> Some more information in. <laughs> I give games to you to learn because when you put an instruction manual in front of me, I want to not exist anymore. You want to whip it out the window. I, and then I, have I want to, to burn it. I have to try and teach it to you after that, which at first feels like I'm trying to teach a child calculus because you just your eyes drift to anything <laughs> that could draw your attention. Well, I could get what me I'm out of here. Yeah. The irony is, is that as soon as I learn it and you explain it to me, then all of a sudden it's not as intimidating. Like I can get into it and <laughs> generally I learn to love it. Yeah. You know, they're great games and they're really not that different than what I'm already used to. I don't know why that resistance is there that I just <laughs> I just don't want to learn a new game. You just need to be gently encouraged into it. Yeah, that's understandable. I want you to to rub my shoulders and calm me down and say reassuring words as I learn a new game system. And you've got a lot of excuses. Like you always talk about you don't have the time or you don't want to make stories in different worlds. You want to stick to what you know. I I make a lot of excuses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's just it is that I don't want to invest three to five sessions in some new system only to find out that I generally don't like it. And I'll just stick to exactly what I know. Thank you very much. Then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? That's stupid. I, then why would you do that? Why would you? Why would you cut yourself out of like? Because I'm stuck, Tim. <laughs> yeah, but so what? Like, that's like saying I never want to go have pizza because pizza's round. That's dumb. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Man. It's a non. It's a non thing <laughs> that a, you're saying. It's a total. Yes, of course it's a non thing. <laughs> or you're like those people that like to travel, but only to one place ever for the rest of their lives. Right? Like, I love traveling. Where do you go? Mexico. Do you go anywhere else? Nope. Do you go anywhere else in Mexico? No. Just the hotel. <laughs> Just the hotel. Yeah, I travel. I go to the hotel. I spend lots of money to stay in that one room and never leave. You're not traveling. <laughs> this is why you're here, though, Tim, is because I understand that that is the path to darkness. I don't want it. Like, I don't like those <laughs> this people. This is the I way. Don't be, <laughs> I don't want to be that person. You wait, uh, no, you're not. We're going to. No. Okay. So we're going to degrognard you. I'm supposed to wait, right? Hi, everybody. I'm here today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, yes, this is the GM Tim, who is a professional GM. He's the OG D and D in a castle DM and OG, and OG. Yeah. one of one of many <laughs> yeah. OG DMs yeah. that was there for D and D in a castle, host and GM of Star Trek: The Lost Voyages on Twitch. He GMs for so many games concurrently, and we get to write together. Yes, we wrote together. We wrote together. We got something coming. <laughs> we're we're general co-conspirators. He is also the co-writer of the upcoming Arcadia issue number twenty. Dropping in September. We think. <laughs> we we think. did the math. We're pretty sure it's September. <laughs> We're guessing. We, general. We won't stop talking about it when yeah. it comes out. No. So you'll yeah. hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Please make sure you go buy that issue so that we're reinvited. Yeah. 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 General, close friend, wine lover. Friend of the show. Friend of the show. <gasps> friend of the show. You already were. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> Tim's the number one friend I've of the show. 
friend of the show. <laughs> sharply so, dressed weirdo. Sharply uh, dressed. Yes. I'm in the Mickey Mouse shirt. Like, I love that. Yes, I am sharply dressed. The edges are sharp. <laughs> You're more fashionable than we are. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, hi. <laughs> so today we're talking about other styles of games and game systems to help facilitate a different feeling than we get with general D and D. Like yeah. here's the thing is that like I, as a DM want to tell a different kind of story, you know, sometimes I want to get into like sci-fi or I want to get into post-apocalyptic, you know, yeah, I love Mad Max. So get into it every time that, you know, we have a conversation and Travis and I complain about some element of the D and D experience. You just talk about five other systems that we could be playing. <laughs> <laughs> you can try this, 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 or this. No, uh, I don't want to. <laughs> I like being grumpy You're about stupid, it. Stupid, then. <laughs> so, what we're here to do today, and hopefully, you, dear listener, if you're anywhere in <laughs> the same kind of space that I am, Jordan, you're willing to learn new systems. Tim knows about s- seven million systems that. You know, you're a professional GM. Seven million. Okay, there's, I, I might be exaggerating. I'm a god among GMs. <laughs> and then you've got me that just wants to resist any new systems at all costs. Simply because, not because I don't like the systems or that I won't like the systems because I'm just fucking lazy. <laughs> well, you know, okay, so I'm going to counter that. You're built to be like, well, I know D&D. And it's that's it. Just easier. It works. Yeah, I've already, I, know I already know it, I know so it. I might as well stick to it. Yeah. Yes. And I've got, as, I've got a counter to that, but we'll wait. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's <laughs> let's get into the main segment, the Oracle's Tower. This is the Oracle's Tower, where gazing into the crystal ball could show you glimpses of potential future adventures. So we're going to use the GM Tim's experience to give us an overview of some really fun systems that are very likely to impress. They're easy to learn and at the very least they're going to give you some ideas to bring back to D&D. But before we do that, Travis, let's get over your specific blockers <laughs> so you can be on board for this conversation. You yeah, old you fuck. are the target. <laughs> All right. So my my first kind of where I dig my heels in yep. is time commitment of learning a new system so D is your first system ever right i wouldn't say that like I so played, what's your first system my very first system was third edition back in high school okay and then i did a little bit in world of darkness okay and then D pathfinder 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 yeah so pathfinder so Pathfinder is, and I'm looking at the books right here, and I even looked at you strangely when you when I came in earlier, and I'm like, you play Pathfinder? <laughs> and I don't mean to like bash Pathfinder. It's not like a bad system. It's just like a heavy crunch system. It's one of the heaviest crunch systems that exists still because it built on 3.5, which was already like a crunchy system. So for you to then sit there and say, well, I don't like a new system, but you learned 5th edition. <laughs> and 5th edition is very much not... Three, five. Did you play fourth edition? Okay. No, we, we kind of skipped over that one. Yeah, but at some point you learned D&D. Well, at some point I learned almost anything. I learned how to drive. <laughs> I learned how to... You learned how to speak. Yeah. <laughs> make a podcast. I, exactly. You learned how to make a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that, like, while I acknowledge that, I think that that's like, that's an easy out. Sure. That's like somebody saying, let's hang out. I don't have time. Just call it like it is. You're not a fan of hanging out. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. So, yeah, so enough. is the is the problem that you don't want to learn new games? Are you just not interested, or are you actually interested and you're just not sure how? I think you're probably right there. Okay. I'm just not so sure then, how. So then, time commitment has been dispelled. Okay, uh, <laughs> <laughs> glad we can put that to rest. Yeah, right. Let's get rid of that. The other piece is that I know that there's lots of little supplements and and add-ons to Five E. Since sure. I already know Five E, but I want to play, say, superheroes. Did you take your grandfather skydiving? No, not necessarily. I'm not sure he would be a fan. So D&D is like the granddaddy of all RPGs, right? It's not necessarily the first, but it pretty much is the kind of prevalent role-playing game that exists. Everybody knows it, and almost all the role-playing games came out of a lack of something that D&D had. 
right? So D&D didn't have something or it wasn't doing something. So somebody made a new system. That's kind of how it started. It's not like an absolute, but that's kind of like the sort of broad stroke, right? Yeah. They exist because you don't take your granddad skydiving. <laughs> you don't take your grandfather where you want to go on a first date with somebody new. Right, you're not going to take Grandpa with you. It's going to be an awkward. It's going to be awkward. concert. Or... He might be there. He might feign enjoyment. Right, he might get to the ground after you skydove and be like, yeah, "That was great," but realistically, he's thinking, "I'm never touching this grandkid again." Right, like he's like <laughs> cutting him out of the will. Cutting him out of the will. Right, like because realistically, there's probably somebody better, like a cousin that you like or an aunt and uncle that you want to hang out with, that is more suited to going skydiving with you. Sure. Right. So why force something that you don't need to force when you can find another person to go with you? Because like you can you can make any role playing game do anything you need to. Mm. Right. Like there's lots of supplements for D&D fifth edition. Yeah. You can make it do almost anything you need to. But does it work the best that way? Yeah. I would argue no. Yeah. There is something probably better that does what you want it to do. You just have to kind of dabble into that. Instead of learning that new supplement, which you have to really rethink how you're going to do something. You could learn a new system. Well put. Yeah. So here's my next challenge is that there are, okay, I don't think I'm being uh, overzealous in my analogy by not the 7 million, but there are literally thousands of other systems out there. I've got overwhelming choice. Uh, You know, I hear a lot about great ones. Which ones? I, I would say I would agree with dozens. Okay. Let's first establish what do we classify as a RPG to learn, right? Because there's a lot of indie RPGs that are like one page RPGs that are like, here's how to be play this game. Right. And those are just as valid in my mind as say D&D because it provides something you might not necessarily want. But there's some really cool, like there's a there's an RPG called Sword Lesbians. Thirsty. Uh, Thirsty Sword Lesbians. Yep. Like this game is ingenious. Like <laughs> who doesn't want to play a game called Thirsty Sword Lesbians, right? And then there's an expansion to it that adds to it and it just makes it kind of like bigger, right? And it started as an indie game and it's been something that's now published. And it's published kind of like independently, but that doesn't negate its kind of like awesomeness, right? No, absolutely not. Um, so if you include all of those, you might get into hundreds, but I think thousands is still a little bit... Damn it. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I get what you're saying though, yeah. right? Like, so there's I, a lot of choice. There's a lot of choice. Um, so how about I throw out some of my favorites? Well, I think that's a great place to to kind of segue into... Typically when I even consider picking up a new RPG... It's because I want to play in like a concept or a genre and I want to replicate Mad Max. I want to replicate some kind of dark heist movie like Inside Man. Okay. You know, that kind of thing. You watched a movie and you're like, ooh, that vibe is good. I want to play in that world. I want to make that character. Okay. So pick a genre. Well, something that's a very different vibe from fantasy. I think is superheroes. What if you want to be an Avenger? Yeah, so I got three superhero games that are like all really cool um, and all very different. So one of them, Icons, I taught you last night. Yes. Yes. So we sat down, we made characters using the Icon system, and we recorded the whole thing. We're going to put it up on our Patreon. All of it. All of it. <laughs> God damn it. I have on record saying that now. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we're going to make that available for uh, strictly for patrons. So there's a, a fun little bonus there for you. Yeah. So the but basics of great Icons. System. So Icons is a 2D6 system. Um, you literally need just 2D6. Uh, Mutants and Masterminds is another D20 system. Um, but it works on a different concept than 5th edition. It's not anything like 5th. Um, and then there's City of Mist, which is another 2D6 system. But it is again very different from the other two so they're all different vibes so uh, let's start with mutants and masterminds actually sure. mutants and masterminds is kind of like the closest to D D and pathfinder so it's 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 a crunchy system okay so when you go into it there's a lot of rules to it and the reason for that is because they wanted to allow for anything right so the system is built to allow for anyone to come in and say i want to build this specific superhero how do i do it 
And so you can dive into the crunch and build that superhero and then play it. Each right? power is going to function. Each power has yeah. its own rule set built into it, right? And it did really well. There's a lot of supplements that go to it. There's rules, books. There's like literally a city book. And it's solid. So and it's then, it's a rich one, but maybe not the one to get into if you want to just dabble a bit. Yeah. So if you're dabbling a little bit, you're going to like really rules light. And I would say that's where Icons comes in. So Icons is built by the same person who built Mutes and Masterminds in order to be kind of like a more suave system, right? So it's literally pick up and play. I mean, we built our first one two days ago in 45 minutes. Yeah. I think we built three characters. And by the end of it, we had a superhero team called Amped. And it was all based on what we rolled. And, and the reason I like Icons is because it's a literal random generated build. So you randomly roll all of your heroes and then you'll pick the top tier, the mid tier and the low tier and discard the rest to be used as like NPCs or random jokes throughout the series. Um, you build a comic book universe. Um, I've actually got a podcast, an old one called Skyfire Comics. You can still find it. Uh, fire is with a lie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like it's like we built kind of like a comic book world around this. Yeah. And every time I play, it like really is really easy to build a comic book world. And if you set that boundary, now you know automatically that it doesn't have to be perfect. So you can kind of build as you go, right? We had a lot of fun last night. Well, one of my favorite things about that system was that by randomly rolling, I don't have to come up with a concept. I'll often spend days yeah. trying to come up with a character concept before I role play it, before I build it in fifth edition this one took the opposite approach by having me randomly roll and me piecing all of that kind of information together yeah. into something that i would have never come up with on my well own. and that that's the thing the brilliance of that system is that like the simple brilliance like the chef's kiss like how did this happen is that if we had sat down and go i'm going to build a character we would have rebuilt superheroes that are already in comic books mm -hmm. we would not have come up with original heroes and instead, last night, we came up with 12 original heroes. Very bizarre, very, very bizarre. original. But, it, but they're not really that bizarre when you think about it. You built Blockhead, <laughs> and you had a character name and a concept and a thing, all because you rolled a one for one of your stat blocks. Yeah. If I said you have a one in D&D, &D, you would get so offended at me. <laughs> you would be, how very dare. How am I going to build a character that has a one? Yeah. I can't do it, but you can. And that's the beauty of this system is it really reminds you that just because Dungeons and Dragons does this one thing doesn't mean there's not other ways to do it. Right. And and I challenged all of you last night that when you go play D&D, &D, try and randomize some stuff. That's the power of dabbling in some of these other systems, that's because right. I'm going to take that back to my experience with D&D. &D. I may not change systems, but I've learned something new about character creation, character generation, what I actually like, how to do something random that surprises even me. Yeah. And see, the thing with the thing with uh, let's let's even dive into City of Mist a little bit. Sure. So City of Mist is one of my one of my like I fell in love with it last summer. It's really new. It actually launched last summer, I believe. Um, and uh, 2021. Sorry for anyone who's like listening in the future. Um, <laughs> uh, so City of Mist. On, so something happened. The mist surrounded the city. And that's all it is, is the city. So anytime you need something outside of the city, it is provided. So you need that urban area. There is a farm just outside the city that's still within the mist. So it's still kind of like, and it just, and, it, and it's there when you need it and not there when you don't. So it's like mixing Once Upon a Time, the TV series, yeah. with... Um, I would say a little bit of Sin City. Hmm. So it's got that like kind of like everything happens in this little town and no one can really leave. Right. But you can. It's not that like demented. It's just it's just that's where the magic happens. Yeah. And the thing about City of Mist is you're not a hero. You're mist touched. And so something happened where you pick. I'm going to actually teach you that system right now. So I want you to I want you to build a character. So your character is what is their job? And I mean that. So like your regular human, yeah. what is their job? Barista. Great. You're a barista. What's your job? Garbage man. Perfect. Garbage man <laughs> and barista. So you've been mist touched. So what entity or totem basically are you channeling? Now it can be anything. So it can be 
Zul from Ghostbusters. You could be channeling an ancient god of the Aztec. You could be channeling um, Oscar the freaking Grouch. I'm going to channel Prince. Prince? Yeah. Uh, like the singer? Like the artist formerly known as Prince. Okay, cool. Uh, and, <laughs> and what about you, the garbage man? I'm going to be channeling a volcano. <laughs> so how about uh how about you need an entity so how about uh, okay. uh how about like the hawaiian god of volcanoes yep perfect now when you build your characters you're going to have these little tags they're literally called tags and you'll get a few of them that do your power so there's logos and ethos so your logos is what you do your barista your ethos is what your mist is if you have all four as an ethos you're lost to the mists you become an npc and i get control over you if you're if you're all the way logos you're just a barista you're not mistouched at all and i get your character as an npc so you want to have somewhere in the middle of those two and these give you little abilities that you can do and you add to your role when you roll so you're saying he's gonna have barista powers so his barista powers might be persuasive convincing patient calm can handle a crowd, can handle angry people, right? Very cool. Your your ethos as the volcano might be fiery, hot-tempered, quick to fire, control of fire. Yeah. Lava spew. Who yeah. knows? Garbage right? spew. Like garbage <laughs> spew. But it's your garbage truck would be like can lift str- <laughs> like can lift things fast, can move, can right. handle strong scents. Yeah. Right? So you dive into what it is that makes you a hero, and then you roll challenge dice. So it's 2d6 versus 2d6. If you beat the number that I have, you're good to go. You've succeeded. So I came into this episode not wanting to learn new systems, and you just taught me a new system while talking about new systems. And that took, what, <laughs> seven minutes? Damn it. You're good. Busted. Mm-hmm. Okay. So just but the to... cool thing is now you've got three different hero games with three different vibes and three different styles of play. Before we go further, I actually really want to make it very clear that I think that it's challenging to dive into a new system and it's challenging to dive into a new genre. There will be times, no matter how many games I talk about, I won't be able to get them all. And you're going to buy a game that will be read once and be like, oh, damn. Mm -hmm. so there's two things about that one don't feel bad that you bought a game that's not your vibe because thank you for buying a game and making somebody who created that a little bit more successful yeah it takes what you two now know it takes a lot just to write a module could you imagine what it takes to write a game system the rest of my life dear lord right and some people have built multiple systems so we really need to like stop bashing a system because we don't like it it just because you don't like it doesn't mean somebody else won't and can't run it for you. Right. Right. So if you don't like that thing you bought, give it to somebody who's interested in learning a new one and maybe they will. Mm -hmm. They might not and it might trade hands again, but that's okay. Right. It's not something that you give it to a local um, youth group, anything. Exactly. If you don't have any friends, find someone. Yeah. Yeah. Someone will always take it. So don't feel bad that you didn't like a game. It's not for everyone and not every game is for everyone. The other thing is you sometimes just have to take a chance. Mm -hmm. You have to just (laughs) you have to take a chance that you're going to find a hook. (laughs) (laughs) That's the name of the show. wonderful (laughs) i'm actually very proud of myself for that one i came up with that right now (laughs) but it's true you have to kind of like just grab a box and and i do recommend box sets that's the other thing i want to recommend box sets are brilliant box sets are wonderful little contraptions they're usually around 40 dollars, which is about half the price of a book so you don't have to feel bad about not buying a full book because they can be a little bit hindering yeah at first when you get a box set, it'll give you some characters, it'll give you an adventure, it'll give you a brief rule set, and it'll give you a brief DM set. And it'll give you some dice, and it'll teach you how to play the game as you go. And a mm-hmm. lot of these systems I learned with box sets. They're yes, here. let's talk about heists. Okay, so heists are not my strong suit. Um, and I'll say that right off the bat. So for me, I run games that are heists in other systems and i've never i've never looked for a heist system so when you suggested this i had to look and and there are two that i know but they're not like my deep dive so there's fiasco and there's blades in the dark 
Yeah. Blades in the Dark is like Buffy, um, Buffy vibes, right? So you're kind of like, you're not necessarily monster hunters, but you're kind of like doing that kind of like deep dive into the background of society and you're kind of like running on the background. You're running in the shadows. Yeah. Um, what we do in the shadows would be actually a great <laughs> TV series. Ooh. Would actually be a lot of fun in Blades in the Dark because it opens that up to like that narrative ridiculousness. I love Blades in the Dark for the fact that it is, it leans towards that episodic. And, yeah, you yeah. know, that's from a storytelling, Buffy, right? Like, yeah, it's like one shot. You don't have to worry about it. If you ran a one shot Blades in the Dark and never ran another one, you've made your money's worth. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of what it's. It's not built for it, but it, it leans into that. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Blades in the Dark is kind of meant to lessen the load of the DM, right? There's a lot less adventure prep that they uh, yeah require. i would say i would say fiasco is the same as well okay um is a, is a better way to put that yeah right that's a system built thing whereas D D has had to educate people to be more group based than dm versus i mean that's that was a core component of dungeons and dragons until fifth edition so for 40 years the core component was dm versus player yeah and it's only fifth that they're like, no, no, that was, we were wrong. It's we play. Yeah. One person is the game master, but they're not, not a player. Right. Right. And so it's, it's had to be conditioned into that. Whereas Blades and Dark Fiasco icons, even you can like, as an icons, uh, the, the game master can build a hero along with the players at the same time. Right. And really lean into that. That's so cool. Um, And Fiasco, Fiasco is another one. So Fiasco is like, so you do need dice, but it's almost a non-dice game. Like yeah. it's very narrative. It's heavy. extremely narrative. Yeah. My best analogy of Fiasco, and this is not way demeaning it, but it's the party game of role-playing games. Yeah. Nice. So it's, it's the game that if you have a lot of people who don't want to play a board game and you break out a party game and they play, I feel Fiasco is like, if you have a bunch of people who like might not want to play a role-playing game, but you break out Fiasco, they might end up playing. Yeah. And then enjoying themselves and being like, oh, that's a role-playing game. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah. an RPG that disguises itself as a party game. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's a good way to put it. So both of those systems, you can talk about like Ocean's Eleven and then break down the scenes into that. It feels very, yeah, it leans into that vibe. Fiasco is so narratively focused that Jordan and I have borrowed a lot of the pieces from Fiasco because it just makes character relationships and character building effortless. Like it's, that's kind of like icons. It's part of the game to yeah. create that narrative. Yeah. To well, create those characters. I mean, that's, that's why I built the Tim game for D&D. Yeah. Was like, and that's why I made it even dice rollable, right? Like, so you have a bunch of questions. If you're going to talk about the Tim game, you got to explain what the Tim game is. Oh, yeah. Sorry. The Tim game, you guys have played it. And I think some of the listeners the last time I was on heard about it. But it's basically a, it's a list of questions that forces the players to talk about the other players. So you don't, you don't create background for yourself. You create background for yourself in relation to another character. Mm -hmm. It encourages a group to have cohesion right off the bat. And then I'll even add in, give me one sentence about your first mission together or your first adventure together. Yeah. And that way it builds a history for you to draw on right away. And it came from things like icons and it came from things like even, even Star Trek. Let's let's talk sci-fi. Yeah, let's indeed. This is your jam and your bread this and your butter. This is my butter, jam. And your yeah. Butter. So so while I run a lot of D&D &D, and, and I, again, this isn't a dis D&D &D game. I really want to take the D out of mastering, right? Like I want to... I, Dungeons and Dragons is the only thing that has a dungeon master, right? Yeah. And I, even in my name, I'm the GM Tim. I'm the game master. I want to be able to run games for people, not just D and D, right? Yeah. So Star Wars has an Edge of the Empire system, which is it's an awesome system that is hard to find right now because of corporate corporate greed, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> okay. So yeah, the company that, that runs it is Fantasy Flight, and they were bought by another company and then shut down their RPG department. And now they're talking about building a new system that feeds into the old one and builds a new one at the same time, but no one really knows. But they still kind of sell the books. So you can still find this system, and I do recommend diving into it because it is brilliant. It's dice are narrative, and it's got what's called a narrative system. They actually call it the Genesis system and genesis is their broad stroke uh gurps vibe yeah so that they built out of this before we continue yeah. can you explain like you know, maybe give an example of what narrative dice means in so it has no numbers on it so it's d6s d8s d12s but they're all symbols so you roll successes and failures and they're dictated by this dice pool that can counter those successes and the successes are countered by failures 
We've all seen Star Wars. Yes. Great. So those of you who haven't seen Star Wars, I'm sorry you won't necessarily get this re- reference because it's a it's a specific scene, but and it's not one that's oft talked about, but it's perfect for this. So in this dice pool, you can roll failures with still a triumph. And a triumph is like a critical hit in D&D. So you can fail critically, not negatively, triumph. And yeah. a triumph gives the player narrative control over the scene on that roll they just made. Makes sense? Right. Okay. Yeah. So the visual I want you to do is close your eyes and remember the scene where they're running from the Death Star heading for the Millennium Falcon and troopers are chasing it. Remember trooper dude that hits his forehead? That's this scene. So right after that, they're flooding into this into the hangar bay while it's, Luke is shooting and missing every trooper because in the original Star Wars, no one hit shit. <laughs> so they're all shooting and they're missing and then Luke rolls and he fails, but he succeeded with a triumph. So he failed the shot. He did not hit the stormtrooper. Instead, He's going to say, instead of hitting a trooper, I'm going to shoot that panel on the side of the wall, close the blast doors, stopping any more troopers from getting in, giving him his time to get away. Right. Nice. So he's taken his failed role and successfully done something else that benefits the party out of it. And that really adds a, a spirit of adventure and, and this, fun. And this happened with dice that have little symbols on it. There was no failure. I have to interject because I recall picking up the box set for Edge of the Empire and I tried it and my immediate reaction to, oh, fuck, there's no numbers on these dice. (laughs) Damn it. And it really it was one of those like, oh, what did I get myself into? And then after playing for like 20 minutes, the the brilliance of that system that you're talking about really started to become prevalent. It is one of the most cinematic systems I've ever experienced because you don't need to do math. Yeah. The only time you do math in, in Edge of the Empire is when you are counting your credits, which you really should never get because your renegade team should always be for the next job, yeah. right? for the next heist. You know, like you dock and everything goes away because it costs so much to dock right? Or you owe somebody money. Always scraping by. Yeah. And the other cool thing about Star Wars, actually, let's talk really quickly about it, is even away from the dice, the characters themselves, every single mechanic is built for a narrative drive. So you have something called obligation that is your literal goal for being. So you're obligated to a hut. You owe a hut money, Mm -hmm. Han Solo. And so everything you do has to be with that realization that you owe that hut money. And the longer you wait, the more chance something bad is going to happen, like you're going to get caught on Bespin, turned into a wall display, and sold back to that hut. And that was all character-driven. That's a character-driven obligation. Yeah. Yeah. So when it's triggered, it becomes stressful for your character. Your character has a mechanical disadvantage to the, to the rounds until you deal with that trigger. And the role-playing happens because the DM can use that into the character story and throw things off. And you can play a Wookiee. And you can play a Wookiee, which is pretty incredible just on its own, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's Star Wars. So then let's let's talk really quickly about Tales from the Loop. Tales from the Loop is a free league system. So it is Mutant Year Zero and a plethora of other games. Tales from the Loop is based off of uh, the Goonies and, and Stranger Things. And it's got a mix of those vibes. And one of the cool things about Tales from the Loop is it's all this kind of like alt universe 80s vibe your characters cannot die because kids never die in movies right so that's the vibe that comes with it yeah and then you've got to kind of like the adults are all peanuts vibe so it's all every time an adult talks to you (laughs) 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 and only very few adults are aware of what's really happening around them just like in those movies right yeah so you've got this kind of like cool vibe to it that it's like you've got mechs rocking around and the adults who know about it are the ones you've got to be concerned about and the ones who never see it are like, that's nice, dear. Why don't you go out and play with your friends? Now? <laughs> right? So it very much leans into that vibe of it. And then there's Star Trek, which is my personal favorite system. And I even run a stream for it. Like I've turned it into a live play stream that I actually am like, <laughs> enjoy, right? Because we actually play it. So it's a 2D20 system for this one. And you're rolling, you're rolling your 2D20 and you take the lowest numbers. And if you succeed, you got to meet or under. It's not meet or beat. It's meet or under your skill levels. And the more you roll under your skill levels, the better you can do. And the system itself is built for you to be a Star Trek character. 
So it's built into your character that you've got this ability. You are the best that the Federation has to offer. You're on a Starfleet vessel because you're that good. If you fail, you're in trouble. And that's the point. Uh -huh. If a Star Trek character fails in the show, you're like, oh, we got problems. And that's what the system is built to feel like. And the GM should be encouraging that because that's the point. It's a narrative cinematic style. Right on. Yeah. And so we've turned it into like an actual series. I even had one group, they were playing their own ship and they decided that we were going to do just like in the TV show when I hit them. They were going to like all lean to the left and then all <laughs> lean to the right and then shimmy. So we had a Got couple it. scenes where I hit them all and they all like jostled to the left and then just like on a bridge, right? Like it was really ridiculous. But the system itself kind of like leans into that. You feel like you're on a TV show. And the more you lean into that, the more you actually like play it, like you're on the TV show, right? Yeah. You do the Kirk Haymaker, even though it really is the worst way to hit somebody. <laughs> Ask your siblings. They know you've done it and it does not work. They beat the crap out of you afterwards. But in Star Trek, it can work because it's ridiculous, right? Yeah. Gorn can kind of look like that and it doesn't phase you, right? That's sci-fi. I, I love, I think the sci-fi genre is really cool. Well, what I love about what you're talking about, so the Free League series, like the Free League makes a lot of different games, but they have kind of a similar thread through a lot of them. So yeah. if you know one, the rest it's become a lot approachable. Rest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other thing, too, that is really important to remember is that once you start getting into some of these games, you realize that there's like a common thread between all role playing games. And, and that's that you're there to tell a story. And if you remember that, then the hard, like the crunch of it all, the mechanics should become easier. But on your point of like, you know, one system, once you understand that they're all about storytelling, it's a lot easier. I mean, when you don't know a rule, you can always just fall back on rule systems that you do know and resolve it like you wouldn't that until you figure exactly. it out. Exactly. And I'll tell you right I'll tell you right now, the day I learned that Edge of the Empire system was the day my DMing changed forever. Because I no longer just look at somebody and go, you hit. Next rule. I demand that they narrate that. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't demand. That's a hard <laughs> board. But like I do, I do encourage like yeah. so my narrative has stepped up because I'm not doing it anymore. So when you're not doing it as a DM, your players realize it's a safe space to expand on what they do. And you're going to allow them to do that. Totally. Because it does not have to be just a number. It yeah. is now a success, right? How did you succeed? What happened in that? If you're ever making a character role in Dungeons and Dragons, there has to be a thing that comes out of it. And if it's a success or a failure, there still has to be a reason that they rolled and a narrative that is presented from that role. Otherwise, there's no point to that role. Right. And learning other systems is what taught me that. Because if you've got narrative dice, I am not going to make you roll to climb that ladder because I need you to get up there. Now, if you're climbing a ladder while it's burning underneath you, now we're going to roll because now there's a consequence to what happens if you fall. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, let's just get up that ladder. Tell me what ridiculous thing happens as you go up. And if you want to add stuff in, then sure, I'm going to make you roll to it. But that's the same with any of these systems. They're all built with that in mind that dice only matter when they do. Yeah. And a lot of the time, D&D &D forgets that. Pathfinder forgets that, in my, in my humble opinion. <laughs> because Pathfinder is really built on that the dice matter all the time. And I feel like that's a, a disservice. But again, that's that purely my point of view. And I know I'm, I'm not in the majority with that. So mm -hmm. people love Pathfinder and power to them. I will never say that a system is bad. I will just say that a system is not always for me. Yeah. And that's okay. I think my one of my favorite things about reading all these different systems is sometimes it's the smallest little blurb or like a tiny rule that just clicks. And it's like all the time I've spent thinking about RPGs and I've never thought about it in this way. Just like, oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's some there's some cool stuff. I, You know what? I actually, if you go to Free RPG Day or search Free RPG Day, you'll find a lot of indie games for free. So when you say that sometimes the money commitment doesn't work, that's actually like even that I can counter with get the free games then. Because there's a lot of free RPGs um, that are given out for free on Free RPG Day by indie developers. And even Paizo puts out like a free goblin adventure 
or had in the past. I don't know what this year's was. Mm -hmm. There's new Renegade games that's putting out new systems coming out. There's G.I. Joe, Transformers, uh, My Little Pony. I'm really excited for that one. I'm not even going to lie. Tales <laughs> of Equestria. Bring it on. Um, uh, <laughs> but the Transformers one, I'm super excited for, right? There's something called Overlight that I've got that I'm like, I love. It's like your hero is like channeling an elemental color. And so there's all the different colors of the rainbow kind of like tie into it. It's very queer oriented without being queer oriented. There's actually the same people that made uh, City of Mist have made Queers. And it's literally a <laughs> queer focused hero game where you kind of have that same vibe, but you're a superhero as a queer person. So it really celebrates like that. But you have to deal with homophobes as part of your challenge <laughs> as, as part of the narrative of the story yeah, like it's really quite cool and it's not that like that's just one element of it but it's like anyway. yeah but yeah there's so many different systems and yeah we listed a few and as i'm talking about it i'm, I'm remembering a bunch more <laughs> that we never even talked about well speaking of free games like if we move to that kind of post-apocalyptic i'm a big fan of post-apocalypse literally called fallout right <laughs> it's an rpg based off of the based off the video game right yeah you've got atomic highway which is like your mad max vibe right literally a deadly cars on cars kicking each other's butts rpg and Jor that's another one that jordan and i have played and again what i love about all of these different systems and the dead spot in my heart for new systems is brought to life a little bit when I know that there are other systems that lean heavily into certain kinds of genres. So for instance, Atomic Highway, the car that you create is just as important as the character that you well, yeah. create. They're, they go hand in hand. Because Mad Max. Exactly. Yeah. Or Tank Girl. And it's, it's like incredibly, well. as, a, as a system, it is incredibly deadly because yeah. Jordan and I just playing around with it found out that, you know, at level one, the first bit of damage that anybody did, it was quadruple the amount of their health. They were instantly kill, dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So again, you got you got Fallout, you got Atomic Highway, and then you've got going back to Mutant Year, Year Zero, Zero is yeah. another. And so that's in that same kind of family of games that... It's Free League. And something I like about some of the games you've been talking about recently is another easy transition for like if you've got a gaming group that might want to keep playing fifth edition then really what you have to do is find a piece of media or a movie that everyone's into and say hey you want to try out a, the world of that movie that we all agree that we love right there are games for almost everything yeah and you just gotta just gotta do it man just gotta do it all right i think we have a lot to to kind of talk about and think about and hopefully action with some new awesome games that we now know well, exist. Well, we did. We actioned icons. And the next time I come, I'll bring a new one. That's correct. And so that recording is going to be available to all of the patrons. And we're going to make that a patron exclusive. It'll be available on our Patreon. You can find it there. And thanks so much to the patrons of this show that make it all possible. Victoria O, Peacock Dreams, DM Thunderbum, Marley R, Gar the Pirate, Time Warp, Dangerous Marmalade, Zach G, No Ma'am, Michelle T, Alan E, Felix R, Chris F, The Senate, Lucas D, Lila G, The GM Tim, hey. What? <laughs> Nevermore, Thomas W, Tyler G, Tyen, Heavy Arms, Eric R, Aldros, Leprechaun, and Will HP. Thank you all so, so much. Absolutely. Tell us about those new games that you play. Thanks to the GM, Tim, for joining us today. Thanks for letting me sit here and talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. As a final mention, we'll also have a couple of links to the GM, Tim's shows, specifically the Star Trek one that he mentioned. It's Check phenomenal. That yeah, it's, it's lots of fun. I'm, yeah. I'm really happy with it. <laughs> it's it's a, just a great time. So thanks again to Tabletop Audio for the sound effects you heard in this episode. You can follow us. Uh, tell us about your games at Hook and Chance on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or Reddit. Yeah, if we if we missed one that is absolutely incredible, you can join the awesome community of players and DMs by joining our Discord. Tell us about it. Yep. And thanks, thanks for, for listening and play, play, play great, great games. Box sets. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs>